I know despite of the huge rain, we still have a uh, big crowd here. Um, it is uh, both a great uh, honor and also a great pleasure to introduce uh, today's uh, distinguished speaker, Sir Michael Morris. Uh, I got to know Michael through an article he wrote about uh, the Phantom of uh, DJI, and uh, actually it was uh, designed by the uh, DJI engineer, which is also an alumni from the ECE department. Frank Wang was not here, but uh, I think Wang Mingyu was here. Okay. Uh, okay, so that article was uh, very inspiring and also encouraging. And then I got in touch with uh, his uh, assistant, and also I think Glenn is on his way uh, to here from the airport. And uh, I learned, uh, you know, encouraging that uh, DJI has a super fan. And of course, uh, I also know another super fan of uh, DJI fan tank is uh, Bill Gates. Okay. Uh, and of course, uh, I think uh, uh, if uh, Steve Jobs is uh, alive, he would uh, also have been a DJI fan. Okay. Because uh, last time on our way to visit Michael, we did a demo outside the headquarters of uh, Apple, and the people just uh, come out. So I said, uh, uh, Mingyu, we have to stop. You know, otherwise, we are not going to see Michael okay, if uh, Tim Cook comes out. Okay. Um, okay, so the reason I mentioned both, uh, you know, um, Steve Jobs and the Apple, we all know it is uh, a great company. Okay. And the, on the other hand, many people perhaps don't know Apple is one of uh, Sequoia children. Okay. It is a company funded and supported by Sequoia. Okay. And also, there is a long list of uh, such companies, including Cisco, including Google, uh, Yahoo, WhatsApp, okay, and I think uh, Michael is going to talk about today. And uh, I also mentioned that uh, Steve Jobs, not because he is a great innovator, and uh, because that uh, Michael is the first person to write about uh, Steve Jobs. And uh, I have a book, which everybody I know have read uh, Steve Jobs, the biography, okay. But this is the second such book, okay? If you open the first page of that book, okay, it will mention that uh, Steve Jobs ran into conflict with a correspondent from time. And that correspondent is uh, Michael. <laughs> and this is his first book, written in 1984, when they were both uh, 25 years old, okay? So I bought, uh, ordered five copies of uh, this book, okay? And uh, I think uh, it is uh, too late uh, to be here. But anyway, you know, if you look at uh, this book, okay, you know, run into argument, and uh, Steve Jobs was uh, uh, unhappy with uh, the article was too revealing, okay? So, um, because, uh, you know, we all know Steve Jobs is a great innovator. So somebody run into argument or fight with him must be bad. But that is not how things work in Silicon Valley. You know, argument, debate, setback, failures are great sources of innovation and the eventual success. I think without this book, okay, this book, with, will not be as popular as it is today, okay? And uh, Steve Jobs learned a lot from his failure, his mistakes at Apple, and he is able to achieve what, you know, he is able to achieve today. So I will, without uh, further ado, I will, oh, okay, I also, you know, by the way, Michael was also instrumental, not just at Sequoia, he was the, he is the chairman of Sequoia, but also launched the China Sequoia program, supported a list of uh, very 
impressive companies in Chinese, uh, Jindong, San Liu Ling, and the Taobao. Uh, Taobao, and the, what's the other? Ali, Aliba, <laughs> okay. Okay, in Chinese, you all you know, have heard of these names. So without further ado, I will pass the mic to Michael. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, it's a, a real privilege <coughs> to be among so many swimmers. <laughs> <laughs> Since I assume that's the way that you all got to uh, the campus this morning. Uh, and thank you very much, Professor Lee, for uh, inviting me here and for uh, your generous introduction. And uh, while I'd learned a little bit from Professor Lee about HKUST uh, in California a few weeks ago, uh, learning and seeing are two very different things. Uh, and I am just astonished and full of admiration for uh, everything that's been built right here uh, in less than 25 years. It's, uh, I'm sure you, all of you don't appreciate it as much as an outsider does, but what you've done is uh, utterly remarkable. And, uh, um, and I want to offer my sincerest congratulations to everyone associated um, with the institution. Uh, Professor Lee asked me to talk about things that uh, I thought might be relevant uh, to all of you. Uh, and so I thought uh, I would um, talk about uh, some of the things that we're working on in California, knowing that certainly at Sequoia, we're working on similar ideas and similar themes and thinking about the world and the opportunities here in China in a very similar fashion. Uh, we have um, made uh, for the last now more, more than 10 years, an enormous effort uh, to learn about China, uh, to work in China, to invest in China, and um, have uh, 70 people who are part of Sequoia who work in uh, Beijing and in Shanghai and uh, also in, in Hong Kong, and are beginning to be, uh, do here in China uh, what for many years previously uh, we've done in uh, um, California. And I know if I was 23 years old today and leaving the United Kingdom, as I did when I was 21 or 22 years old, I wouldn't be going to California. Uh, I would be coming here to live uh, in China. And with that, I want to give you a glimpse. First of all, my major theme is going to be about the personal revolution that all of us together are building, whether it's here uh, or in California. But I'll give you uh, my impressions through a California lens. Uh, but before that, I wanted to talk just a little bit about the connections between science, the community, money, capital, uh, and the construction of companies, and just give you very quick glimpses of what's been possible in Silicon Valley, what will be possible right here on, the, on, the, on your campus, um, and the snapshot of some people and companies that we encountered when they were very small and nobody had heard of them, and uh, what they turned into um, today. So this is the company that Professor Lee was talking about that everybody is familiar with. This is what it looked like when Apple made its first investment. Uh, it was as raw as some of the robotics labs that we just worked through. This is the, a picture of a custom-built case for the first single-board Apple computer. And this is what Apple and the two Steves, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, looked like in 1976 when Sequoia uh, became the company's first investor. These two people I think you'll recognize, Larry and Sergey. 
the founders of Google, both of them students at Stanford University at the time that we first met them. And this is what the Google search product looked like in 19, at the end of 1998, beginning of 1999, uh, when we first became involved with Google, when it had seven employees. This is a company that has just announced it's going to establish a major presence in China, LinkedIn. And this is what the home page of LinkedIn looked like before it had 300 million users around the world, as it does today, and a picture of the office of its founder, Reid Hoffman, 11 years ago when we made our first commitment to that company. And Reid was also a student at Stanford University. Airbnb, I think, is present in Hong Kong, is not really present yet on the mainland, but is on the way to becoming one of the major sort of network, internet, mobile economy network companies. Um, and this is what the three founders looked like uh, six years ago, seven years ago, when we became the company's first investor, uh, when really it was just uh, the three individuals who were involved. And today, uh, they have outposts in 150 countries around the world. And Dropbox, again, I think present in Hong Kong, not uh, present in China. Uh, now, outside of Apple, Microsoft, and Google, the sort of biggest data repository for files anywhere in the world. And this is what Arash and Drew were like when we encountered them in their apartment in San Francisco seven years ago when it was just two people. So the only purpose of going through all of that is to say that the bridges between a university like yours and the staircase and steps to assembling very important, extremely impressive companies that touch a lot of people are not very distant. Because people like us will always find people with extraordinary talent and capabilities and ideas for extraordinary uh, products and services. So having said that, I'd like to talk about what we are in the midst of, which again, I think because we live it every day, we breathe it every day, uh, we don't really often appreciate where we stand uh, in the scale of uh, industrial evolution. And um, I'd like to offer you some sort of perspective of um, the opportunities in front of us, and also perhaps a bit of a guideline for what we at least think will be the characteristics of the defining great companies of tomorrow. Uh, lots of companies get started every year. Um, there are hundreds that get started uh, in California. There are thousands that get started in China. But very few of them, just a handful, become companies like Apple and Google and Tencent and Taobao. Uh, every generation has an opportunity to be involved with just a few of those. And those are the ones that we're primarily interested in. But before talking about that, let me give you a bit of a backdrop. Because much of my commentaries are going, are going to be about the importance of tools uh, and the importance of data. And here we are perched at the early part of the 21st century. And it's hard for us to recognize that not very much happened in the world in the modern era for the first 16 or 1700 years. If you look at this picture that was taken in the 17th century, it's not a lot different from what you would have seen uh, if the picture had been taken or the scene uh, characterized uh, 1,000 years before that. 
And the major point is that the tools didn't and hadn't really evolved. That's the first point. And the second point really is that people worked where the tools were. So that the workforce, obviously, here in China, also in the West, uh, in the 17th century, was rural. It was not urban. It was not metropolitan. And uh, everybody basically made their living from the place where they could use their tools. And the place that they could use their tools uh, was on the land. And then in Britain, um, really at the beginning of the, um, of the 18th century, with the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, there was an extraordinary shift that wasn't really recognized at the time, but now with the perspective and detachment of history, we can recognize it, of tools moving, the most advanced tools moving to central places, moving to factories. And the first incarnation of this uh, was in the cotton industry and in the uh, effectively the precursor of an industry that Hong Kong knew very well decades ago, the garment industry, where the loom in particular uh, and uh, production of looms and the agglomeration of looms inside of factories allowed for the very first time workers and people to congregate uh, in one place and for the very first time in human history, you had the beginning of the migration of people from the places where they had used to work with tools in the fields um, to a central uh, workplace, uh, the early factory. And this is a very simplistic, and the only reason I put this up, it's um, sort of simplistic graphic, but I want to come back to it a little bit later to illustrate the change underway today. You had lots of people um, now going to a central workplace. The workplace had um, suppliers that provided uh, um, different, uh, different components. And um, the workplace uh, perhaps made um, garments and all those sorts of things and used channels of distribution um, to get to the eventual purchasers, um, consumers like you and me. Now, the next major shift in this, all of this, uh, occurred with, the, with um, the organization of the automobile industry. An organization, the Industrial Revolution had moved then from Britain to America. Uh, this was 100 years or so later. It's really the second chapter uh, of the evolution of the Industrial Revolution. And the big change here was that tools met the assembly line. And you had labor organized in a fashion that it hadn't been um, organized in um, during the first phase of uh, the Industrial Revolution. And the result of this was that the central workplace, the factory, attracted many more workers, employed an order of magnitude more people um, than uh, the first organized central workplaces. And the supply base, all the suppliers of different materials that you can imagine for the automobile industry, um, began to congregate around the industry. And the importance of an organized, logistical, uh, highly efficient supply chain uh, became evident for the first time. And the manner of distribution didn't evolve very much. Resellers, dealers, retailers were needed to connect the central place of uh, production uh, with the eventual uh, purchases. So I give you that backdrop, which we'll come back to, but also wanted to recognize a few things that have happened probably in the period since um, uh, Professor Lee uh, went to CMU. Uh, and from the time that I started my own work life, and I suspect 
most of you or many of the people in the room here, how many people were born later than 1986 uh, in this room? A distressing number, I can see. <laughs> A very distressing number. Well, um, it's hard for you. I don't want to appear like too much of an old doddery character, but it's hard for you to recognize, because you've grown up with it, the extent of the, the rapidity of the technological advancement of the last 30 years compared to the previous 200 years. We are living, you have grown up in, an era that is unheralded in the course of human history because technology has never advanced at the rate at which it has advanced since uh, the time that you were causing problems for your parents as babies. And this is one vector that underlies everything that you will be working on for the rest of your lives, which is the explosion of bandwidth in the last 30 years. Um, and it's difficult for anyone to remember that today, um, uh, um, uh, the era before um, acoustic coupler modems and 300 board modems uh, at a time that we uh, deal with uh, very high uh, wireless rates of uh, transfer from uh, flying machines to their smartphone controllers. So that's one vector. The other is what's happened with storage. Again, we take it all for granted that the uh, uh, solid state drive in one of our mobile devices is capable of storing whatever the newest version is capable of storing. Uh, but again, uh, it underlies and is one of the building blocks for the future that everyone here is going to build. And then finally, computation and the power of the central processor has evolved in these dramatic fashions. Again, unimaginable almost uh, 30 years ago, unless you, you were at the heart of the semiconductor revolution. Almost impossible to conceive. And, to, and then finally, I'd like to talk about something that, again, we take for granted at a day when you, know, you can go to the App Store or the App Exchange and find hundreds of new ideas in software compared to just 40 years ago when the most popular computer in the world, or 50 years ago, the IBM 360, at its peak, only had about 250 applications that were available to run on the hardware. So I was trying to capture a sense of what all of this means, the, the increased bandwidth, the um, storage, the increase in computation. And the numbers actually are far more dramatic than this slide suggests. If you go to the right of the slide and look at a smartphone, whether, whoever it's made from, uh, made by today, and compare it, compare the computing power within that phone, and I'm not talking about everything else that phone possesses, the sensors, the still and video uh, photographic capabilities, the fact that it has accelerometers and can uh, function with a GPS satellite system that didn't even exist in 1973. Just the raw computing horsepower in the smartphone that, because this talk is so boring, you're probably looking at, um, right now, uh, the, uh, the smartphone that you have in your laps that cost in US dollars about $750, that computing would have cost you in 1973 $33 million. But that was in, 30, in uh, 1973 dollars. If you adjust for inflation, your smartphone the equivalent computing horsepower in 1973 would have cost you $150 million. And so when you're building the robots and everything else that you're working on here, you are the sort of um, uh, 
beneficiary of these uh, extraordinary uh, advances. And the implications for the way that companies created, the way that we will live as a society, uh, and the way that we will conduct our lives in the 21st century are extremely, I think, extremely profound, unlike anything that we've ever seen uh, before, and will shape the way in which um, companies are conceived, built, uh, and operated. So here is another attempt to capture uh, something that I talked about a few minutes ago, which is the evolution of tools. You can think of uh, automobiles uh, as obviously being a tool of conveyance that uh, most people can uh, benefit from. And the numbers that I've got here are US numbers, realizing that the Chinese automobile market is, this is my colleague Glenn, who has just flown in through thunderstorms and lightning from Shanghai and is part of our, <coughs> our large uh, presence here in uh, Sequoia's large presence here uh, in China. Um, and this is a number of the automotive tools sold in America in the peak year of production in America, eclipsed in the last several years by production of new vehicles um, in China, I understand but peaked at about 15 million new vehicles. The peak number of tools to automate home laundry, washing machines, in America was 17 million about 10 years ago. New fridge sales, refrigerator sales, were about 11 million. And this year, there will be, or last year rather, there are about 700 million 150 million dollar tools, smartphones, purchased by consumers all over the world. So I hope these last few slides have helped set us a, a bit of a perspective for the extraordinary backdrop of the age in which we, in which we live. And one of the other things that's happened since the time that many of you were teenagers and entered um, this university was what's happened to um, many other aspects of, of, of tools. And this is really pronounced in the United States. Almost all of the computing infrastructure that was very expensive for a startup company to obtain 12, 13 years ago has become close to free whether it's web services or open source databases or um, applications that um, Microsoft used to have a corner on the market uh, for, or SMS messaging, a $100 billion a year business for the carriers around the world that effectively has become free thanks to WeChat here and uh, WhatsApp uh, in, in uh, other countries. And here are other things that have become free. LinkedIn has made it far easier for people in the West to recruit people and saved companies gobs and gobs of money because they can now do in software what used to require uh, humans. Similarly with the management of sales forces uh, that work for large companies in America and in Europe. A lot of what used to be done with manpower uh, is now done uh, with software. And you all know how social media networks can be used to uh, promote products and companies and individuals in fashions that are far cheaper uh, than possible before the entire world was interconnected and everybody was on their $150 million device uh, that's sitting in their pocket. So I'd like to switch and talk about what this incredible change of the last 15 years in particular has provided 
for those of you who are thinking about how to start an extremely significant company and to take, begin the journey that some of these other people took from Stanford or MIT or Berkeley or Caltech and begin that journey right from here because it's eminently achievable and there will be far more great companies built in China in the next 50 years than there will be uh, in the United States. So here are some examples of the companies, and I'll come, and come back and try and explain what I mean by the data factory um, in a little bit. But here are some examples of companies that are automating functions of labor um, that uh, previously, 20 years ago, uh, required tens of thousands of people um, to, uh, to, to work on. And the major point here is that these companies that sit at the heart of their respective universe are providing for free or close to free very powerful tools for people to develop and build their own businesses on. And these tools, unlike in the previous generation with the automobile companies and the and other forms of uh, older industry, the tools don't require uh, people who want to use them to go to a uh, central workplace. This is the same in the era of, uh, in, the, in the arena of financial services, where software and companies that sit at the core of a network allow people to raise money over the internet um, for close to nothing, taking out a lot and removing uh, a lot of the uh, problems that over the decades have always confronted people trying to raise money. And again, these companies sit right in the middle. They sit between people who want money and people who have money. And there's no need for any physical connection to be made by, by those two different constituencies because of the software and the power of the tools that these companies um, uh, in the, uh, provide, these companies like the ones here on the, on the, on the slide uh, provide. I think you probably all read about this company that Facebook bought last week called Oculus. That raised its money, its original money, without knowing any of the people who were investing because of the power of one of these data factory operators, uh, a company called Kickstarter that's a small, doesn't have many people working for it, um, company with an enormous influence uh, based in New York City. And then you have the most powerful companies of all. And I could quite as easily have put some Chinese names on these, uh, on this slide, but the Chinese companies, at least for now, mainly operate in China. These companies are more global, uh, at least today, in their footprint. But all of them are the most, these are the harbingers of the personal revolution, and I'll come back and explain why that is in a moment. And they share several characteristics. They provide extremely powerful tools that people all over the world uh, can use. They allow the users of those tools to connect directly with their customers rather than going through distribution channels. And most importantly, from the standpoint of each of these companies, is that they retain an enormous amount of data from which they can um, uh, develop new features, but also provide a lot of intelligence and value to each of um, the constituents on, on either side of the fence uh, of, their, of their companies. And so the result of all of this is quite shocking compared to 50 years ago. 
You have these data factories, Google, Amazon, LinkedIn, Facebook, sitting in the middle, who don't employ many people anymore in the grand scheme of things. Because the power of the tools that they've provided is dispersed all over the world. So these enormously powerful and influential and valuable companies don't employ many people, but they've pushed their tools out to people who used to have to come uh, to the central workplace. And their tools are used on the other side to help the uh, people who take advantage of them uh, connect to their customers. So this slide, if you look at it closely, is very different from the way in which industry and large companies were organized um, in, in the 20th century. And this is the way companies are going to be organized at least until there's some other incredible technology breakthrough that uh, we can't imagine quite yet. So here's one example. I mean, what I'm going to do now is riffle through a whole uh, variety of examples, hopefully to help plant the seed of how to think about some companies that you might want to start or, or get involved with. Here's LinkedIn, which has become a global microphone for business and uh, professional content. And it has on its central platform about a quarter of a billion professional members all over the world, the largest congregation of, uh, of professionals on any network uh, in the world, which means that it becomes an incredibly effective uh, vehicle for people who want to recruit or hire or people who, on the other hand, are looking for a job and uh, others who want to communicate with a quarter of a billion uh, people uh, all over the world. And because of the power of this data factory and of this central platform, it is able to recruit lots of people to communicate for free on its service to the business and professional community around the world. And here are some of the people who do that on the LinkedIn platform. The result being that you have a little company in California, or a company in California that didn't exist 10 or 11 years ago that is now the largest business publisher uh, in the world. Uber. I don't know, is Uber, a, Uber is a name that's familiar here? So Uber has become a phenomenon in the United States. And why? Because if you think about it, it's a data factory, and it does two things. Uber sits in the middle between uh, chauffeurs, drivers, who are looking for work and looking for regular work, and individuals who want to go from A to B. And it has improved life for both constituents, just as LinkedIn did for its respective constituents. Drivers um, can now make more money on the Uber platform as Uber drivers than they could in their prior uh, incarnation because they have a much more effective way of connecting with passengers. And passengers get an improved level of service that was inconceivable before Uber changed the dynamics of that uh, particular marketplace. And here's a picture of one individual, who a guy called Sam Taylor, who used to work for UPS, which is a truck delivery service in America, and now makes way more money as a driver on Uber. And if you think about it, Uber has put the tools of his profession in his hand on a smartphone. Instacart is a little company in California that we're involved with. It does online grocery shopping for consumers. Supermarkets, most supermarkets and grocery stores in America have no way of delivering directly to consumers. Many consumers have better things to do with their time than go shop in supermarkets. Instacart knows a lot about the products that are in supermarkets, and it knows a lot about what consumers want to shop. 
and it sits in the middle as this specialized grocery online shopping data factory. And even though it just started a year or so ago, it's now doing 7,000 deliveries a day in five cities across the United States, soon to be a lot more, connecting um, the needs of both constituents and again, putting powerful tools in the hands of both constituents. Consumers who want to shop for groceries and then the individual contractors like this lady, Laura, who makes a lot of money using her smartphone to go shop uh, for Instacart clients and uh, make deliveries to their home. It's a very similar theme for a company called TaskRabbit that basically is an errand ma management system for people who want particular things to be done. And this is a marketplace connecting the needs of people who want errands to be run with people who are uh, prepared to run errands. And um, you know, here's a lady in San Francisco, this lady Rosemary, who um, makes a lot of money. She, she's making close to $100,000 a year uh, working for TaskRabbit, again, using the tool uh, of, of the smartphone in, uh, in her hand. It's just unbelievable what's, what's happened here in the period of really, if you think about it, 300 weeks, the last five or six years. eBay obviously is a very no well-known uh, example. This character here um, uh, um, sells refurbished uh, televisions. And he, he runs a $5 million a year business based on the eBay platform using all the tools that eBay um, allows him um, to operate on and being able to connect directly um, to uh, customers via, again, other tools that uh, eBay provides. Google is the ultimate data factory. There's an example here of a um, little company that had lost its audience, a little flower manufacturer that uses Google AdWords. This is a tiny little company, and it didn't have the means and wherewithal in the days of newspapers and radio and television and billboard ads to be able to promote its wares. It was too expensive, it was too cumbersome. There was no feedback from uh, the advertisements about how effective these were. It uses Google AdWords, and now thanks to Google AdWords, has uh, built, rebuilt uh, a flourishing business for itself because it's been able to pay for and promote uh, its wares very successfully and establish direct um, uh, communications with its consumers. YouTube is another example of a data factory. There are any number of YouTube phenomenons, as you well know, around the world. People who have built names, livelihoods, existences, uh, and income for themselves using YouTube tools and connecting with YouTube audience through the data factory that is YouTube uh, in a way that you couldn't do if you were relying on trying to get auditioned by a movie company, trying to get distribution on TV and cable channels um, uh, tw uh, 20 years ago. So this is one very well-known example. Um, in the United States, a lady called Michelle Fan, who started uh, a channel uh, where she just filmed herself putting makeup on. And she now has 5 million followers who regularly tune in and check out her channel. CNN, just by contrast, very, very popular in America, CNN. Many of its most popular broadcasts only have about 300,000 viewers. <laughs> so it's an extraordinary contrast. Amazon is like Google. It's in that scale. Amazon, Google, Apple, the three in America. Where the, the, this is an extraordinary um, uh, company in many regards, but it operates uh, along with those other two companies this uh, immensely powerful uh, uh, data factory. 
And one of its most powerful incarnations is what's called Amazon Marketplace, which allows third-party sellers access to the power and the tools of uh, the Amazon um, um, distribution system, physical distribution system, as well as the marketing and sales system uh, of the Amazon platform. And here's one example, and there are thousands of such examples, of a guy who took advantage of the Amazon tools to build a business for himself. This was a guy in the Midwest who, in America, who made sleds um, and was quickly going out of uh, his business and struggling to stay afloat. And now, thanks to Amazon, uh, he builds and sells more than 14,000 sleds a year and has created a wonderful business uh, for himself. Um, and there are hundreds of thousands of such uh, examples in these, in these uh, different businesses. Here's a different twist at, uh, uh, of um, different marketplace, that, but similar characteristics that Amazon goes after, which is self-publishing. And the authors, uh, uh, the uh, you know uh, uh, market for for writers and for uh, and for publishers, um, much like Michelle Fan in the movie business, for people who have an idea about how to write a book, before Amazon self publishing came along, it was a terrible process. You had to get an agent, you had to get a publisher, you had to get uh, distributors. Uh, it was a nightmare, and at the end of it all, you wound up making. Uh, a fairly small amount of money. And this uh, person here, Teresa Reagan, was rejected by the traditional mainland publishers and decided to use tools that Amazon provides on something called Kindle Direct Publishing. And as a result of using those tools, um, she sold uh, nearly a quarter of a million books uh, her own books on the Kindle platform. So she went directly to Amazon, didn't go to any of the conventional publishers, and bypassed an industry that had been around for 300 years to connect herself with an audience way bigger than that traditional industry would ever have been able to connect her with. Similarly, I won't belabor the point, um, Amazon Web Services has created, this is the third leg of Amazon, uh, has created an enormous flourishing business for people who um, um, deploy web services to companies, um, particularly in America and, uh, and in Europe. I have a few examples. I don't want to, you, you've got the major drift of uh, the points that I'm trying to make, but the, the most distinctive companies that we're involved with are these companies that sit in the middle that um, have an enormous amount of software and intelligence and power, employ extremely smart people to build that, and then push the tools out to users who then can connect with uh, people all over the world. Weebly is a, an example of one of these companies. You probably don't know this one so well. It's, it's a, a web publishing um, tool that's taken over in popularity from WordPress in America. Airbnb, uh, we talked about a little bit earlier, um, you know, they now book more hotel nights uh, in America than the Hilton uh, hotel chain. And the result of this is that guests have very happy experiences, but people who rent out a bedroom in their home are now able, in America, to pay off their home mortgage, pay for children's college education, have disposable income that prior to the Airbnb data factory um, they, they didn't have. Trulia is a company that does something similar for real estate agents. Um, and this lady was a struggling uh, realtor uh, before the Trulia um, network and platform uh, came along and has built her business on that. And this is a company, again, another company in California, House, that is effectively linked in uh, for builders and contractors and architects and home designers. And they're connecting those professionals with people who are looking to 
renovate or uh, redo uh, their homes and houses. Um, and house sits in the middle between those two uh, constituents. I, I won't go through these other three. This is the more important slide. Look at the implications. And they're enormous, and I don't pretend to have any of the answers. I can just point it out, um, social implications here. Uh, look at how many people Google employs today all over the world, 40,000 people. Look how many McDonald's employs or Walmart employs. Or if I had put up General Motors when it was at the peak of its success and operated those factories to which all those people came, it employed 700,000 people. Um, and good, Apple employs 80,000, but that's distorted because about half of those work in its retail stores uh, around the world. Um, and the, the result has been, I think, that these tools have been promulgated everywhere, and all the power has been pushed out which means that the opportunity for those of us lucky enough to be w very well educated is better than ever, ever because we have more powerful tools at our disposal. But for those who aren't very well educated, the future um, um, looks pretty cold and rather uh, forbidding. And you can tell this, and look at what's happened. It's obviously a very different chart in China for entirely different reasons. But this is the result of the third leg of the Industrial Revolution in America. The household income, this is the first time in the history of America that this has been the case, has barely changed in 40 years. It's quite shocking and extraordinary. But it's the result of this um, technological change. Similarly, this is wage standards. Uh, this is also what's happened is there's been less demand for uh, less skilled uh, people uh, in America. And again, a third slide um, to register the same point. For those of us lucky enough to think about, be involved with, create, help build uh, the companies of tomorrow, it's a wonderful place to be. For others, it's a very disenfranchising uh, um, prospect. Now, fine, this is my last slide, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. I think the, the wonderful thing and the wonderful opportunity sitting here in Hong Kong is that you sit right in the heart of tomorrow. And all the sorts of things that I've just talked about, while there are plenty of companies, some of the ones that Professor Lee mentioned at the beginning, taking advantage of these themes in China, you all, your generation's going to have many more ideas of um, the sorts of companies that can be built using these sorts of premises um, than uh, any of us uh, older people. And you also have a very distinctive advantage, an additional one, which is you're very familiar with China. And it will be Chinese companies largely because of proximity to the marketplace, number one, proximity to the incredible logistic and supply and manufacturing infrastructure that you have on your doorstep here that is many moons and time zones away from other companies in the West. Those two things afford you an extraordinary advantage over uh, the, uh, the companies in the West. And I don't, you know, it's obviously no coincidence that today seven of the uh, most valuable 21 internet companies in the world are Chinese companies. And as I said earlier, I think that proportion, particularly if you take advantage of the opportunity, um, uh, is sitting right on your doorstep. And I realized actually, but this slideshow was already loaded, that I should have changed this last slide to say not California and the personal revolution, but China and the personal revolution. So thank you all for bearing with me, and I hope it was of some use. <clears throat> It 
would you like to have some Q&A? Yeah, question. Or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, please. So Moritz, uh, thank you for uh, coming to Hong Kong and uh, for giving this fantastic talk. Um, it's a fantastic um, presentation, and, and the slide that really caught me is medium household income in the US, inflation adjusted, has been flat. Um, to the extent that you can talk about what you've seen, do you, uh, what, what companies you see are trying to do something about structural unemployment you know, in this world due to you know, labor skills being displaced. And I can't talk very much about China because I'm less knowledgeable about the details. I think in America and in the West, it's the companies aren't doing it. They feel some sort of, some of them obviously feel some sort of social obligation. Um, but it's it, it, that, st those structural issues are the problems that governments are trying to solve. And they're trying to solve them in the predictable ways with and they're very difficult to solve because it starts with education. And uh, if you have an uneducated workforce, if you have problems keeping five and six year olds in school, as you do all across the West, let alone 12 and 13 and teenagers or high dropout rates at colleges, um, there's not much that you can do about it. So the governments, uh, I think most government uh, uh, focus is on um, improving literacy, improving education, and uh, you know the uh, OECD education scores that everybody looks at that rank Shanghai so highly in math and uh, other skills are the envy of, um, of, of people, people in the West. So it's a very difficult, intractable problem. Hi, Michael. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, so. Um, um, first of all, I look at your slides and realize how much my life has been shaped by Sequoia. So oh. I use most of the companies <laughs> I, I hope subscribe we didn't ruin to. It. No, I subscribe <laughs> to Michelle Fan's channel when she had only one million subscribers. So, um, well, thank you because you talk mostly about internet uh, companies, and me and my students we create an internet company that uh, looks at users' likes and dislikes in terms of music and. Uh, what kind of restaurants search for, and do predictive analytics with our technology. Now, one thing we found that in China, when we talk to investors about um, funding this kind of businesses, some investors keep telling us that, uh, you know, in China, you know, the, there's BAT, they call the three internet, uh, top internet companies yeah. BATs. So basically, the game is over for anybody else. No. There's BAT, and you should just work with one of them, or try to sell to one of them. And that's it. Don't even think like you can compete against them. Um, so it, it is a kind of a strange point of view to me. I know where they're coming so from. So it's, it's the same sort of point of view in America. And uh, the only reason that Glenn and I have a job is that that isn't true. <laughs> uh, because and, and part, of, part of the reason that, and I don't for a moment want to say these aren't extraordinary companies, and that one shouldn't have the most great respect and admiration, and if you're starting a little company that might compete with them, a certain amount of fear about them. I agree with all of that stuff. But if you think about what you just said, which is you have extremely strong companies at the center of an industry, and it's too late for anybody else, if that's true, it'll be the first time ever that it's true. Because every single company that I mentioned, if you, and which is why I put those photographs up right at the beginning of my talk to show how small and insignificant these ventures seemed, because they weren't companies. These were a couple of people with a product. If you go back to the beginning of Apple, and the story is the same, and I could just change the names. There was an Apple in the computer business. The idea that two people would be able to take on IBM, Digital Equipment Corporation, Data General, and then a raft of other companies would seem inconceivable. When Cisco started, the big question was, the BAT equivalent then was IBM, it was DEC, it was a company called 3Com, and there were a whole bunch of others, and they, here you had little Cisco. When Google started, there was no chance that Google was ever going to be successful in search because you had Yahoo, 
uh, in particular in America, to some extent AOL, uh, and a couple of other companies as well. So it's what we hear every single time a little company begins. Now, in many cases, the skepticism is justified, and the people are doing something too obvious, and they will get crushed by the big company of yesterday or the big company of today. But um, part of the reason that I like doing what I do, Glenn likes doing what he does, is we get involved with people when, when it's at the point that it's them and us against the world, with everybody saying, it's mission impossible, it can't be done, um, and you're going to get crushed and the big companies are, are going to wipe you out. But as I said, particularly for companies like the three that you just mentioned, or Amazon, or Google, or Facebook, or Apple, where you have extremely uh, aggressive, hungry people still running them, you have to be thoughtful and careful and humble when you start uh, a little company. Look at Xiaomi here in China, right? If you had said there was an opportunity to go up against, just a few years ago, I mean, I, um, Samsung and Apple, and perhaps back then Nokia. Think about Nokia, uh, how dominant that was in this world, or Motorola in, in the cell phone world. And then you have a phenomenon like Xiaomi. Um, I think that's just a living, vivid example of why um, I don't believe in the power of the incumbent. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Just, uh, just a short question about California versus China. Uh, since Sequoia has involved in China right now, what is your experience uh, between the difference between California and China in terms of government involvement and those uh, kind of, uh, because in China, the wealth is mostly dominated in the real estate right now. And uh, I know that those technologies, to some extent, personal freedom, sometimes maybe uh, interfere with, uh, with, with, with uh, the government. Uh, it's what, what your view of uh, your experience? I, I think um, the rules in, uh, in China are, um, fairly straightforward. Um, I think uh, we found in the places that we do business uh, a much more hospitable view of the role of business and the uh, way in which young businesses can help um, provinces come along and employ people. And it's a much uh, more conducive and setting far less hostility between government and business in China than there is, um, oddly enough, that, uh, in the United States. And I sometimes say only half tongue in cheek. You know, when people, people sometimes in California come and say to us when they hear about what we do and what we've built in China, you know, this is a Western view. Uh, gosh, how can you, how can you possibly? How can you possibly do business in China? And I always say to them, my stock re reply is, have you ever tried doing business in California? So, uh, which is extremely difficult to do because it's a highly, highly regulated place with all sorts of weird and strange things that, that you have to conform to. But I think in both places, the, it's, it's not government, it's the, it's the imagination and creativity of individuals that lies at the base of everything. And you ally that and the enormous desire for improvement and ambition and the work ethic in China uh, compared to the West. I, th I just think China, and I know people in China always you know, tend to look at, to the West I think you sometimes, and I say this quite with full of admiration, um, I think you underestimate all the advantages that you have. I come to China and I watch and I listen and go visit companies and think, oh my goodness gracious me, I, 
you have all the advantages that we don't have uh, in the West. Very different view. I think so many more people from America in particular would do so much better in their businesses if they did what a lot of Chinese people do, which is come to America to learn. I think America should be coming in droves. Business people from America should be scientists, engineers, should be coming here to ask questions, to listen, and to learn, because it'll make them uh, far better and more competitive in, in the next 10, 20, 30 years. OK, we can take uh, two more questions. This one question from there. Okay. Uh, thank you, Michael, for the interesting talk. So I noticed that all the companies you have invested in, such as uh, YouTube, such as Amazon, such as LinkedIn, are software or internet-based companies. Yeah. So my question is, are you losing confidence on the hardware or manufacturing it's a fantastic, companies? Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic question. And this, to some extent, this is a don't take this as a full picture of what we invest in. I was interested in just exploring this one theme, tools and the huge change in, in our sort of organized daily uh, business life. But underneath it all, we have investments, a lot of investments in the West, in uh, systems companies, security companies, um, storage companies, uh, software-defined network companies, some robotics companies that didn't make it into this presentation. So I was just giving you a view about some of the uh, companies that tapped into this theme of the data revolution and, and uh, or personal revolution and the data factory. Making it possible are a raft of companies next generation networking companies, next generation firewall companies, next generation security companies, next generation storage companies, next generation virtualization companies that we also have investments in and none of whose names uh, I, I, uh, I mention. So if, if that helps. And you can go to our website and you'll immediately see that I was just giving you a view of a fraction of the universe. But these companies have an advantage over some of those other companies because if they tap a theme because of smartphones, they can build their business globally overnight. And if you're building a storage company or one of these other companies, you've got to go door by door uh, selling your, uh, selling your uh, uh, work. It's just these companies grow more quickly. They may not have more durable businesses long term, but it's just different dynamics. Okay, we will take the last question. Okay, uh, thank you, sir, for your presentation. But my question maybe is really related to the other one. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned lots of impressive companies. Do you think are there any characteristics shared by those companies? And if there are, do you think they are the trend for the future business development? Thank you. We tend to, the answer I think, at least for me, is fairly simple. That um, it was started by people, and those individu the individuals who started them, their founders, had a, a very fanatical idea about the sort of product that they wanted to build, and that they were very demanding individuals unwilling to compromise on their sense of the product that they wanted eventually to distribute or to sell to consumers. And the very best companies over the long term, those people have stayed at the top of those companies. And um, you know, there were companies that I didn't mention like you know, Microsoft for many years while Bill Gates ran it before he had time to fly phantom visions and things like that. Um, that operated with that sort of drive and fanaticism where he was involved very deeply, even when Microsoft was a big company, in the design of, of the products that his machine was selling. The same was clearly true at Apple. The same today is true at Amazon, it's true at Facebook, it's true at 
uh, Google. Um, I think that's the hallmark. You, you have to do all the other things. You've got to get it right. You've got to have incredible infrastructure. You've got to operate very efficiently. You want a low cost basis. You want an incredible supply chain. You want to have people who sell and market very efficiently. But for me, it begins and ends with the product. And the product voice and the product vision in the great technology companies comes right from the top. Okay, I know there are still lots of people have uh, questions in mind because of the time constraints. Uh, so the question answering part, uh, we will stop from here. So we will try to get uh, Michael back, okay, after this uh, visit. And the, as a appreci appreciation for, you know, the wonderful talk, for the inspiring talk, we will have a little gift for Michael. And uh, so Wang Mingyu brought his uh, Phantom Vision 2 Plus. It, oh. it has not been released. Ah. It will be oh. released uh, in a week. So the number is 001. Oh, thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>